Deep in the Amazon, a battle is raging. The Peruvian government has plans to auction off most of its rainforest to national and global corporations hungry for the area's vast natural resources. But the jungle's indigenous people are refusing to give up their land or their way of life. He says, I'm not scared and I'm prepared to fight to the death over this. Now, for the first time, tens of thousands of tribespeople are uniting in revolt. On a journey into the Amazon rainforest in northeastern Peru. This jungle is home to the indigenous Achua people who've lived here for thousands of years. We've been traveling up the River Corrientes for three days now. We're in one of the most remote parts of the Amazon. We're near the border with Ecuador. As late as the 1970s, the Achua were one of the few indigenous Indian tribes in this region to be unaffected by the modern world. The tranquility of the river ended abruptly as we arrived in the village of Jose Alaya. And that is the community. These trucks are passing right next to the community, just here. Despite the remoteness of its location, petrol companies have been drilling here for over 30 years. There's a stink of sewage everywhere. It looks like a slum, and we're meant to be in one of the most untouched, beautiful places in the world. Apart from a few women and children, the village was almost deserted. Former community leader Abel Nango Piñola was born here. He told us that villagers were not consulted when the oil company moved in and that their traditional way of life had been destroyed. He says, the operations make so much noise that it's scared away all our animals, we can no longer hunt. Abel said that since hunting became impossible, the men of the village have had no choice but to take work with the oil companies to feed their families. When the Occidental Oil Company first came here in the 70s, there was no government regulation on consulting with local people before moving in. Adolfina Garcia remembered its arrival. She told us it was her first contact with the outside world. Helicopters and planes descended on her village. All of a sudden, there were these machines, cars, things we'd never seen, people we'd never seen, and we were so frightened and so scared of them. She said that when oil drilling began, villagers started to get sick after drinking water from the river. She claimed her granddaughter is ill in hospital as a result of drinking the water that she believes is polluted. Do you ever wish that you had your old way of life, that the oil company had never come here. She said the villagers were happier when they could hunt and fish, but felt they couldn't return to how life was before. It's just a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they need the petrol company and they're getting things from working for them. And on the other, they say that they miss their old way of life and their land is polluted. Occidental Oil was the first to drill here, but sold its Peruvian operations in 2000. The company is currently in court contesting accusations it had affected the health of local communities. In denying the allegations, Occidental says it's unaware of any credible data to support them. In 2006, the Peruvian Ministry of Health took blood tests of indigenous people in Jose Alaya and other Achua communities which showed that two-thirds of all children tested had above safe levels of lead in their blood. Plus Petrol, who took over from Occidental, deny that their operations are responsible for the high metal concentrations in the blood. As we were leaving Jose Alaya, we spotted a group of men arriving who clearly weren't from the village. Villagers told us they were from a Peruvian oil company called Ramshorn, here to negotiate with community elders over access to their last remaining plot of virgin land. 
community members we've spoken to here have told us they don't want another oil company to move in. They don't want drilling or exploration on their land. Javier Casas Tequen is the head of community relations at the company. He told us that Ramshorn had built a community centre for the village. Unlike people that we've spoken to, this gentleman says the majority of people he's spoken to in this small community have welcomed this oil company. He says this community wants this oil company to come here and work. Guevara Sandy Chimboras is fighting to keep the oil companies out. He's a leading member of a federation of native Indians that represents over 30 communities in the Peruvian Amazon. For the past three years, he's been documenting pollution caused by oil spills, which he claims happen frequently. He wanted to take us to the site of a recent example. Along the way, we passed an area of land over six kilometers long that Guevara claimed had been subjected to continuous oil spills over many years. He said the cleanup operation has already taken two years. Guevara said the latest spill had been caused by a burst pipeline. Guevara is just walking through this area and he's saying all of this area is being contaminated with crude oil and all you have to do is just pick away at the earth and underneath is this black, thick, tar-like substance. Look, and this is from an oil spill Guevara says happened a couple of months ago and it's still all here just from touching the soil. Look what's happened to my hands. Guevara then took us to the site of a spill that happened over two years ago. Already I can smell, it smells like petrol, and then looks like black, thick tar, and the stench of petrol is really overpowering. Guevara said that even though the cleaning of spills meets government requirements, it still leaves residues afterwards. He told us that spills like this can affect nearby communities. This water eventually runs in to the River Corrientes and Guevara says that is where indigenous people drink from. That's where they fish from. Look how it's been contaminated. We asked Plus Petrol, the company that drills here, about the allegation that oil spills are causing environmental damage in the Jose Elia area. They did not respond, but in the past have said Plus Petrol not only complies with the country's legal regulations, but that in many cases it establishes new and better standards. We travelled inland to the city of Iquitos, Peru's largest jungle town, to meet with an environmental group. Hola, Jose Carlos. Hola, Mucho gusto. For the past five years, Jose Carlos Guerrero has been helping indigenous communities affected by the activities of oil companies. Los pueblos indígenas. He told us that people are becoming increasingly angry, not just about pollution, but what they claim to be about breaches of their basic rights. Jose Carlos has just told me that the indigenous groups, what they're fighting for, and he said he wants to show me a map. The Amazon jungle accounts for nearly two-thirds of Peru's territory. Over the last two years, the government has proposed laws that would open up more of it to oil, gas and mining companies. It says the Amazon's resources should be shared by all Peruvians, not just the indigenous. Jose Carlos has just pointed to this map. This map is from 2006. And these green areas are pieces of land that the government has sold the rights to companies to extract oil and gas. Now, compare this with the most recent map of the country, and you can see how the government has carved up nearly all of the Amazon basin to oil and gas exploration. Jose Carlos told us that native Indians had begun staging protests against further exploitation of their land. One demonstration a year ago in the northeastern oil town of Andoas had turned bloody. Scores of protesters had been arrested, he said, and 25 men are currently on trial on charges relating to the incident. We met two of them. John Vega Flores and Teddy Guerin Dharma 
told us there'd been reprisals after the protests. They had disturbing pictures, which they claimed were evidence that police had killed a local man, Carlos Cotima, shortly after the demonstration. You can see that there's a puncture mark on his thigh, and it looks like he's been stabbed by something. Um, John, how do you know that he was killed by the police, as you say? How do you know he wasn't killed by someone in the community? They said there was a witness to the killing. John told us the government's actions are forcing indigenous people to rise up and rebel. He says that uh, these petrol, oil and gas companies have been on our land for nearly 40 years now and they've taken everything that we have. We travelled along the Pastaza River further into the northern reaches of the Amazon to Andoas to see if we could corroborate the men's story. Andoas was once a small indigenous community, but it was transformed into a petrol town when an oil company arrived over 30 years ago. Only recently have locals begun to protest, demanding better social benefits like health care and education. We tracked down Ilario Mukusha, the man who claimed to be the witness to Carlos Cortima's murder. Ilario and Carlos had attended the protests against the oil company along with the majority of the village. Two weeks later, the two men were fishing in a nearby lake. Uh -huh. He said, we were down here when Carlos got killed. Mm -hmm. Ilario said suddenly they saw armed policemen approaching. They began to give chase and the men ran off in different directions. Ilario says, I thought that he'd made it, but he never returned home that night. He came back in the morning to look for his friend. Nilario says, we found his body here, he'd been badly beaten and burnt. Nilario told us he and the other villagers are now too scared to fish in this area. We were taken to meet the dead man's wife. Hola. Maria Torres Dawa has three children. She claimed the whole family had been protesting when the police started using tear gas and then opened fire. She said they ran for their lives. Maria told me a policeman was killed by a protester in the ensuing violence. She believes her husband was killed by police in a revenge attack. And Maria says that the police said, we will kill indigenous people, and this is what they've done. They've killed my husband. <laughs> At the time, the Peruvian government claimed that the police did not fire on protesters and that its intervention was to restore order and respected human rights. A local man has been arrested for the murder of Carlos Cortima. The police have not responded to allegations that it was a policeman who killed him. We had seen what appeared to be the environmental and social fallout caused by years of drilling on Atua land. And we'd heard that opposition to any further expansion of drilling or mining was growing stronger. We continued on to an even more remote part of the Pastaza River Basin. The main difference between here and the River Corrientes is that oil companies haven't infiltrated this area to the same extent as the Corrientes, mainly because communities here are resisting all attempts by oil companies to drill on their land. Actual communities in this area still depend on the forest for nearly all of their daily needs. They're suspicious of strangers, but the villagers of Washinsa had sent word to us that we could enter. It's really quiet. All these houses are traditional Atua houses, and there are very few signs of the outside world here. <coughs> Women and children were busy cooking and gathering food and firewood, while the men were out hunting. <laughs> this man had just caught a rodent called a mechas 
part of their staple diet. He told me it just took him two hours to hunt this machas. This was the first community we had visited where villagers could still hunt for animals in surrounding jungle. Cesar Zuniga, president of an association of Achua peoples, told us this animal would feed up to 20 people. Cesar invited us to join him on a fishing trip. Okay, he's saying that they're off to fish now, these small children in the canoe. The men were using the ground down leaves of a jungle plant to catch the fish. It takes all the oxygen out of the water and hopefully the fish should come gasping to the surface. And that's when Feather here and the boys will strike with their spears. Over 800 people fish on these lakes and streams for their food. Cesar told me he'd visited settlements on the Corrientes and seen for himself how rivers become polluted when oil companies move in. He said his community can't afford to let that happen as they depend on fish for their survival. The next morning, the village elders had called a meeting. Representatives from four local communities arrived. The people of Wyshinsa have united with neighboring villages to resist the oil company's attempts to buy the rights to their land. Dance and it's used to call people in the community to go to war. But here it's being used to rally members of this community to fight against the oil companies. The actual leaders said they were fed up of being approached by the oil companies. Rempe Wasum Kukush said that the oil companies don't listen when they're told they're unwelcome. He advocated taking stronger action if they continued to ignore the community. Many of the men here have been talking about taking up arms to fight oil companies. We talked to two local leaders. The government says that the resources in the ground here should be shared between all Peruvians. Manuel Tampet Nayarip said this ancestral land and all of its waterfalls, trees and rivers belonged to his people. This doesn't belong to the government. Tayuhin says if an oil company was to come here, the community would block its path. He says, I'm not scared and I'm prepared to fight to the death over this. Some groups have already begun the battle. We travelled to the northwestern town of Bagua, where in June, 3,000 demonstrators blockaded a major road. They were demanding the government halt its plans to exploit their ancestral land. The protesters clashed with police, and more than a hundred of them are now facing criminal charges. Many are living in hiding. We travelled to a secret location in Awahoon Indian Territory to speak to two of them. Bernabe Ismino and Francisco Ukencham are wanted by the authorities in connection with the protests. Bernabe said the road blockade had been peaceful until a heavily armed police force was sent in. He said they started firing at the protesters. He said we weren't armed, we weren't expecting it, and we all started running and then we realized that some of us were getting killed and injured. Francisco told me he'd seen three of his friends killed and he himself had been shot. He just showed me where the bullet entered and the exit wound he said was so big that you could put three fingers into it. By the time the incident was over, there were at least 33 dead, including up to 20 policemen, many of whom had been speared to death. 
Several policemen were killed by Awahoon protesters. What do you think of this? Burnaby says he wasn't there when the policemen were killed, but told us he understood why it happened. What he knows is the indigenous group to which he belongs believes in revenge. He says if a family member is killed, we will seek revenge. Francisco said he felt the government had abused its power by killing innocent protesters. He said if this isn't resolved, I think that the situation could get even worse. The Peruvian president, Alan Garcia, has insisted the police acted properly and the government claims it acted in self-defense. But President Garcia has admitted to a series of errors in the handling of the protest and public outrage over the incident forced the prime minister to resign. Now some families of policemen killed by protesters are supporting criminal charges against police commanders. In Bagua, we went to meet the family of a local man who'd been killed during the protest. Like most of the Peruvian population, Eugenio Tikliba and Domitila Sanchez are not indigenous, but mestizo or mixed race. Their son Abel was shot on his way to his market store when the Bagua protests erupted. Eugenio says Abel was the only member of the family who had a secondary education. He was their hope for a better future. He told us that everybody in the town knew his son and everybody loved him. The family took us inside to show us video footage of the protests. So now we're seeing images of the main square and, and around the police station are protesters. You can see none of them are armed. There are a few guys here with slingshots. That's it, some guys are throwing stones. As the indigenous protesters had camped out for nearly two months, local people showed support for their cause by supplying them with food and water. Eugenio and Dormitillo have just pointed out the body of their son, Abel. He's been covered by a blanket, he's in hospital, and the scene is absolute mayhem. He's surrounded by bloodied bodies. Since their son's death, Eugenio and Domatilla have become increasingly sympathetic to the indigenous struggle. Eugenio told us he believes the jungle is their home and they're protecting it. Domatilla says, I want justice, not only for my son, but for all the innocent people killed. They say they are united with indigenous people and that they are all people of the Amazon. Following the violence in Bagua, the government was forced to revoke two proposed decrees that would have given big companies more access to the Amazon. Yet nine others remain. After years of growing frustration over exploitation of their land, indigenous groups are rebelling. They say they will not give up the fight until all the decrees are overturned. If the government does not concede to their demands, the country could be facing another phase of bloody violence.